Okay, I think we can start now. Yes, great. Okay, hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the to this session. The session is about uh, crypto analysis of block ciphers. This session uh, we have uh, seven papers. Uh, Christophe Dubuin, Grigor Lender, and myself are moderators of this session. Uh, the first uh, paper is Quantum Security Analysis of AES by uh, Xavier Bonatine, Marinaya Plasencia, and Roy uh, Schwarten uh, Low. I hope you pronounce it uh, well. Uh, and um, Andre will be the touch. Hello. Pronunciation was fine. Uh, I know it's difficult. Um, so sharing screen now. Okay, is it okay? Right. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, thanks. So in this paper, yes, we are going to study quantum security analysis of AES. Uh, so that means uh, we study quantum key recovery attacks on this cipher. So what is a quantum attack first? Uh, it means that we are going to go below the complexity of the exhaustive search. In the quantum setting, exhaustive search is global algorithm. So basically, uh, if you take AES-156, it has 256-bit key, and uh, global search gives you a square root speedup of the exhaustive search of the key. So it's to do the uh, 128 uh, AES evaluations. It turns out that this is actually a strong constraint, if you think about it, because this means that uh, in the classical setting, we need to make attacks that go below classical exhaustive search. Here, we have a stronger constraint. We must go below global search. Uh, despite that, uh, we studied uh, several types of uh, attacks and uh, quantum algorithms um, to, to, to make these attacks in the quantum setting. And uh, we, could, uh, we could find uh, attacks that reach basically one round less than the best classical attacks in the, in the uh, for key recoveries for AES. So, judging from these results, uh, AES seems to resist the quantum attacks that we studied. So, uh, how do we do that? Uh, we have a design process for a quantum attack, uh, which works in this way. We find that uh, if you want to go below global search, uh, which is basically exhaustive search, uh, and which has uh, this very good square root speedup, then uh, the best way to do uh, seems to use exhaustive search. Um, but of course, the procedures are going to be a bit more complicated. Uh, in particular, we're going to write algorithms that, uh, for example, do an exhaustive search over some space, and then in order to test an element of this space, do another exhaustive search. And um, it turns out that if you combine these uh, procedures, then you can obtain a score root speedup. You can replace basically all the searches by instances of reverse algorithm. And uh, in this way, you may obtain a global score root speedup on your attack procedure. So the idea is to write a classical attack um, as a sequence of nested exhaustive searches. And uh, we use, basically we define a framework in which we can write this in a purely abstract way. And then you have either a classical procedure either a quantum procedure, which should have a complexity almost, a square root, almost as a square root as the classical complexity. And so this enables to prototype uh, quantum attacks to check easily if they are faster than global key search. And afterwards, of course, still need to uh, study uh, both like the technical quantum details, some post-processing that comes from uh, small, li little classical factors and premises of success. But the, but the main idea is to uh, write everything abstractly, uh, forget that we want to use quantum algorithms at some point, and uh, prototype this in a purely uh, classical way. So here is an example. This is a path of our attack on eight rounds of AES-156. And it's a demi cdc meet intermediate attack, so it follows a classical pattern. I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, you have basically uh, a search uh, a sieving over some bytes of the outer keys in this path. And um, given, given some choice of these outer keys, we look for differential pairs that will give us a differential in the middle, uh, blue to red in this figure. And if we find a pair uh, that satisfies this differential, 
then we can run another search. Uh, we can basically use a distinguisher for the middle ones and check that, well, the guess of keys was good. In the classical uh, attack, we compute a table for the middle part. So the middle distinguisher is completely, is completely tabulated and we search over the other key bytes and for, guess, for, for testing a guess of the other key bytes, basically we use the table in the middle. The quantum attack, we couldn't do that. So instead of having a table, we have no table and uh, we make another search, uh, which is where you can see that we have an algorithm which does a search inside the search and all of this is going to be replaced by Corbus algorithm inside Corbus algorithm and so on. Um, turns out that we could still go below the uh, complexity of exhaustive search with that. It also gave us some new ideas for classical attacks of this type, uh, because in the classical setting here, we had a search over the sub key bytes on the table for the middle. In the quantum attack, we had a search over some key bytes on a search in the middle. And then we thought maybe we could do uh, the other way around. Uh, we have a table for the sub key bytes and a search for the middle. And it turns out that uh, if you take this idea, so tabulating the sub key guesses and saving them, uh, it gives you some better time memory trade-offs on the uh, DMSSS who committed the middle attacks. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, this paper was the first uh, analysis, uh, secret analysis of AES in a quantum setting. So trying to find uh, the quantum security margin, how many rounds uh, we can attack uh, with a procedure better than Guava. Uh, we really tried to write these attacks in a very uh, abstract way so that we can uh, prototype them without talking about quantum algorithms at first. Uh, there are some technical details that may be of independent interest, for example, for solving as well as differential equations. And this, uh, so for AS-256, we reach a night round attack. Uh, AS-256 being the variant that is uh, usually recommended for post-quantum security. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next paper is uh, Extended truncated differential distinguishers and round reduce AES by Jin Jin Bawa, Jiang Gu, and Ayak Lis. And Ayak uh, will present the paper. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. Please Super. go ahead. As said, this is joint work with Jin Jin Bao and Jiang Gu. Um, a few words on motivation. The sum of per independent permutations is well known, mostly in provable security, where we know from a lot of works that use, for instance, mirror theory or the chi-square method now, that this construction is close to optimal CQ. So we have a lot of works that have studied that in the past. So it's a good and well-studied approach for turning PRFs to PRPs into PRFs. Of course, there is this very trivial distinguisher where you just collect all but the last query and uh, since everything has to sum to zero, you can predict the last query. One work by Paterin went beyond this point of where the usual interest in provable security ends, where he imagined what if some of the outputs are just random, which breaks this very trivial distinguisher, but which motivated his search for more stable distinguishers, as he put it, and he observed that he could still distinguish the sum of permutations from a random function by observing the number of collisions that occur. And this is, a, depending on how many independent permutations you have, it's a little more or a little less. Um, yeah, it's a little more or a little less than the number of collisions you would expect from random. So quite interesting work. The question is, what does this have to do now with distinguishers, with differentials and the AES? And the interesting fact is it can be useful for extending integrals. Um, after we were right in our work, we found that a previous work by Janet Alt already had considered this in a different context for lightweight ciphers, but so they deserve also credits here. So take the well-known three round distinguisher on AES where you just change the value in a single byte. After three rounds or after two and a half rounds, every byte will change. And then the mixed columns operation at the end of round three will destroy this all property and integral distinguisher and have still a zero sum distinguisher, but the integral um, stops at that point. Now, since 
the values will not collide after two and a half rounds, the observation was, could we approximate that by yeah, the sum of independent permutations at that point? So of course there are some hidden assumptions, but this was the observation that motivated our work. Because then if we could do this with enough queries, and here this size of n is by far not the block size, we could distinguish the number of collisions that occur after three rounds. And since values that collide before the S-box will also collide after the S-box, we could extend this integral to a further round. So there's also work by Krasi and Reschberger um, where we could use their statistical framework form. So we could extend this three round integral by a fourth round where we just count the number of collisions that occur in a byte afterwards. For a random truncated permutation, this is slightly above, below 2 to the minus 8. Whereas for the AES, if we could approximate that, there would be an additional term of 2 to the minus 32 in that order. And taking this statistical framework for a sufficiently high success probability, we just need enough pairs and we could extend this. So this is, of course, not a very powerful distinguisher. It's just for proof of concept here. Of course, there are many optimizations further possible. Now, of course, we wanted some indication and we implemented this also with a small version of the AS by Citadel that is established in that context to just see, does this work? And for the random world, we just used spec 6496 as a random truncated permutation. This is extremely close to the experiment for small AS. Yes, this is a distinguisher. It's even a better distinguisher than we thought. Um, of course, there's some more details on that. Now, from that four-round distinguisher, of course, we could extend this to another round where we don't consider a single byte, but we consider four byte collisions at a time, because then this diagonal, of course, will translate over two more rounds, and we could still count these collisions. And still, we have a gap also after five rounds. So there's an additional at then that is extremely small in the order of two to the minus 52, but still taking enough pairs in theory, we could also propose this distinguisher. Again, we implemented this um, still on the same setting. Here we needed more data sets, of course, than in the um, foreign distinguisher to be able to distinguish it. But again, we found that this distinguisher also seems to work. Again, the small AES version overshoots um, our theory. Now, in contrast to other distinguishers, of course, they're not that powerful. It's more um, proof of concept. And there's also an interesting work by Krasian Reschberger, who also considered such low bias distinguishers in contra whose complexity is also a little lower than ours. In contrast to theirs, the advantage of our distinguishers presented um, a minute ago is that we start from a single byte. So we could simply extend this by, for, by prepending a round and just guessing the first diagonal of the key. We did this in the paper. We used the models that, has, that have established by Selchuk and by Samaida and Sakar, which is a little more recently. And there are more details of that in the paper. It's also just a proof of concept. We also implemented this for the small version of AES to see that such a distinguisher, uh, such a key recovery attack can work. Now, the idea from that key recovery was that why not take this entire diagonal structure of pairs and try to see if this still gets a distinguisher? Because there will be still pairs that will have a single active byte after the first round. And the other pairs, we hope that they would behave randomly enough. So if they would just give no distinguisher at all, then we hope that there still is some considerable um, bias in the probability of having yeah, such an inactive anti-diagonal after six rounds. And if we use this theoretical model, there is an additional addend. This is now extremely small in the order of two to the minus 74. Using the same statistical framework, we get that now we need much more pairs, of course, two to 120. But since this is pairs and not chosen plain text, we get maybe a distinguisher in the order of two to 89.43. Again, we wanted to have some indication that this works and also implemented this on a small AES version, again, with full spec 64 um, as a truncated random permutation and small AES. And again, we obtain from our experiments a uh, distinguisher from that. Here it's depicted in the values per structure, which is again, very close for truncated random permutation. And again, the small AES overshoots. Um, please don't be confused by these 
um, standard deviations, it is distinguishable. So this was very theoretic. And as you have seen, the small AS overshooted in all our experiments. So of course, there are assumptions in there. There are the assumptions that it does not matter which positions we use as active in and outputs. And there is an assumption that the S-box doesn't matter. We had a closer look on these two for the position. We considered all possible input and output positions for the foreground distinguisher. And this yielded an equation system that was feasible to solve. Here, this is plotted as then as the theoretical values we observed. And we also did this as experiments for the small version of AES. And we found extreme, we found large deviations. If you see here a value of zero means that the probability of a collision at the end does not dis there's no difference in that from the random truncated uh, permutation and hey, I, I think uh, time is over. Can you please yes. uh, conclude? I conclude. So we see a lot of distinguishers actually here and that it's really position dependent. We also consider this for the real AES where we see the deviations are much lower. So there is good hope that the small size of the small AS and the few rounds give the side effects. We also consider this for the S box, where we use different S boxes in the small AS and found okay. some relevance, some correlation to the variance of the quality of the S box. Yet this is not the full story and many more uh, things. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Thanks a lot. And sorry yeah, for thank you very much. much. Uh, so the next um, uh, the next talk is uh, differential attacks on craft exploiting the involutionary boxes and tweak additions uh, by uh, Hao Gu, uh, Si Wei Sun, Damping Shi, Ling Sun, Yao Sun, Lei Hu, Meijing Wang, and how will present the paper. Yeah. How? Oh, please go ahead. Uh, we don't have your uh, voice. Uh, How? Oh, can you hear me? We don't have your uh, your sound. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't open the... Okay, now it's fine. Please go. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, thanks for the introduction. We now, we now introduce our paper. <clears throat> In this paper, we attack the lightweight block cipher craft using its involuntary and simple components. We found the 16 round differential distinguisher, a 20 round weekly differential distinguisher, and we perform a 19 round key recovery attack to craft, to craft for the first time. We note that the number of the rounds of craft is 32, so our result is far from threatening the security of the full craft. Craft is a lightweight takeable block cipher. The block size, through block size and tick size, both are 64 bits. The 128k is divided, divided into two 64 parts, k0 and k1. And the tick schedule is that tk0 is k0 xlt, where t is a tick and uh, TK2 is K0 XL QT, where Q is a permute neighbors operation. And the in round T, TK T mod 4 is XL on the state. And uh, we can see that the TK, TK schedule is very simple. And MC is a simple linear transformation. And there is a special property that the last two rows are unchanged after MC. It is one of the critical properties of our attack. In RC, a constant act only acts out on the yellow cell. The position don't influence our attack, so we omit this operation. And the PN is a permute neighbors, and we can see that the last two row, the, the last two rows of ZT are transformed into the first two rows of WT. It is another critical properties of our attack. And SB is the S layer with 16 4 bit involuntary S boxes. From the features of these components, we can see that the last, the last two rows of XT are equal to the last two rows of YT. And if the, if the last two, ro two rows of TK is zero, then the last two rows of YT is equal, are equal to the last two, ro two rows of ZT. 
and after the Pn, uh, the last two rows of Zt are equal to the first two rows of Wt. Consider the two round craft. We focus on the red cell. We assume that the value of the orange cell on Tk is zero. Then we can deduce that the value, the value of this red cell are equal. And as S box is the red free, so we have Zt1 is equal to Xt plus 2 1. So the difference the difference Zt1 is equal to the difference Earth Xt plus 2 1. And if the difference on the blue cell is zero and the value of the orange cell on Tk is zero, we can deduce that the difference Thursday T1 or Thursday T1, this is green cell, is equal to the difference third x t plus two one. This. This invariable property of the two round craft is the foundation of our work. And although we don't know the value of k, we can control the trick to change the value of the trick k. So we can test some tricks, test some tricks, and then there must be a trick k satisfying our condition and the distinguisher holds. Using this property combined with MLP, we found the system round contented differential distinguisher of crafts with probability 2 to the power minus 55. In this distinguisher, we need the trick k on the, on the orange cell as 0 or a, and we can test some trick cells to change the trick k. After testing 2 to the power 12 tricks, there must be 8 tricks that make the distinguisher hold. Besides, we found a 20 round big k differential distinguisher with probability 2 to the power of minus 63. And if, if we can control some cells of trick, the weak k space is 2 to the power of 127. We perform a k recovery attack to craft, to craft for the first time. Using a 15 round distinguisher, we recover the k, we, we recover the k of the 19 round craft. And the difference between our k recovery attack and the traditional method is that we need to, we need to test some tricks as our distinguisher holds only under some conditions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next talk is a comprehensive security analysis of craft by Hussein Hadipur, Sadiq Sadiqi, Majid Miknam, Ling Sang, and Nasur Baberi. And Hussein will give the talk. Hussein, please go ahead. Thanks for introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Thanks for introduction. Uh, this is a five minute presentation uh, of our paper entitled Comprehensive Security Analysis of Craft. Uh, given that Craft has been briefly described in the previous talk, I will omit the first part and uh, go directly to the, to the second part where I wanna talk about the zero correlation distinguishers of Craft. We had three main contributions in this work. Uh, we improved the zero correlation and integral distinguishers of Craft by one round. And we also improved the differential distinguishers of craft uh, by four rounds. So let's go to the this section. Yeah. Um, Ankeli and others in FSE 2019 uh, showed that considering tweak schedule in zero correlation computing analysis of a tweakable black cipher it yields better distinguisher in terms of a number of rounds. Uh, this uh, simple toy tweakable black cipher uh, shows the core idea very well. As you can see, when you consider the tweaky uh, schedule in zero correlation cubed analysis, some extra linear constraints are induced and uh, no, the, no new variable is introduced. So uh, uh, the possibility of existing a zero correlation distinguisher is increased. Uh, taking into account the tweaky schedule, our strategy to search for zero correlation distinguishers can be divided into two parts. The first part that is performed by computer um, in which uh, we generate a bit oriented MILP model to describe the propagation of linear masks. Then for all input output masks with Hamming weight of one, uh, we call an MILP solver such as Gurubi to solve the problem. The input output masks for which the MILP problem becomes uh, invisible yields a zero correlation distinguisher. A second part using manual approach, we extract the contradiction inside the discovered zero correlation distinguishers. 
So these are our zero correlation distinguishers for 14 rounds of craft. Uh, the nebas that are represented by a star in this shape uh, are not involved in our zero correlation distinguishers at all. In other words, uh, only one nibble of tweak is involved in our zero correlation distinguishers. So uh, as you can see, uh, all of our zero correlation distinguishers cover up to 14 rounds of craft, which improves the previous results by one round. Now let's move on to the next part where I want to talk about the integral distinguishers of craft. Uh, Bogdanov and others in Escher 2012 revealed the fundamental relation between integral and zero correlation distinguishers. They proved that uh, zero correlation distinguishers can always be converted to integral distinguisher for the same number of rounds. So we use this relation to convert our new zero correlation distinguishers to integral distinguishers. And this table summarizes the specification of our integral distinguishers that are obtained by converting our zero correlation distinguishers to integral distinguishers. As you can see, uh, all of them cover up to 14 rounds of craft, which improves the previous round by uh, one round. Now uh, we come to the last section of this talk where I, where I want to tell you about how we significantly improve the differential distinguishers of craft. Uh, using CryptoSMT, which is a useful tool for cryptanalysis of symmetric key primitives, we observed that clustering effect has a great impact uh, on the differential cryptanalysis of graphs. Uh, as an example, as you can see, uh, while the best previous differential distinguishers uh, cover up to 10 rounds with probability 2 to the minus 62, taking into account the clustering effect, we could provide a 10 round differential distinguisher with probability 2 to the minus 50. How are computing the differential effect uh, using automatic methods based on MIP or SAT is a very time consuming task, especially for higher number of rounds of craft, for example, for 12, 13 or 14 rounds of craft. So we looked for a better strategy. Uh, looking for a better strategy to compute, the, uh, to efficiently compute the differential effect, uh, we had some inspiring observations. For example, we observed that for these input output differences, there is always a, an optimum differential characteristic for any even number of rounds. We had also a similar observation for odd number of rounds. Uh, we also observed that these distinguishers can be divided into three parts uh, in which the middle part is a repeatable one, just like this picture. Mm. All colored cells in this picture represents active active cells, except cyan cells that represent uh, cancellation after mixed color. As you can see, uh, the middle part is repeatable, and it can be repeated as much as required to construct the longer distinguisher. The advantage of uh, this partitioning technique is that computing differential effect for each of these smaller parts is significantly easier than computing the differential effect for the whole of distinguisher. So by fixing the input and output differences, we computed the differential effect for each smaller parts and all possible combination of uh, internal differences, and then stored the results into some matrices. Uh, Hussein, sorry, uh, time is almost over. Please try to conclude. Yeah. Assuming that craft is a Markov cipher, the total, the, to the total probability can be computed by multiplying these matrices. So this is the end of my talk where I've summarized my results in this table. Before I finish, let me just say that all of our codes are publicly available via this link. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, talk is uh, improved security evaluation of SPM block ciphers and its application in the single key attack on Skinny by uh, Ben Ying Zhang, Mei Chen Chou, Jian Gu, Enes uh, Paseli, and uh, Wei uh, will uh, present the paper. Wei Ning, do you hear me? Uh, 
Okay, sorry. Okay. Sorry for the time. <laughs> I'm Yin from Shandong Normal University, and this is the joint work with Mitran, Jian, and Anz. <clears throat> Uh, this work is motivated by the work of Sun uh, at Crypto 2016 and the skinny crypto analysis. Sorry. <clears throat> In Crypto 2016, Sun uh, proposed a metrics based approach, which only extracts and theories a binary information, marrying whether words appears or not. More sophisticated distinguishers taking into account the exact number of occurrences can be deduced from the matrix based approach, but can be derived using our method. <clears throat> Skin is a family of lightweight block ciphers proposed at Crypto. It has the similar SPN structure, just like that of AS. <clears throat> Sorry. We represent the output of the first round by the plain text words in Formula 1. By iterating this representation for seven round, we can get the expression of the it word of X7. It is the XOR of two S boxes. In the first Xbox, P12 appears once and P13 appears five times. In the second Xbox, P12 appears twice, but P13 appears once. By this theorem, we conclude that this word is balanced, but uh, <coughs> the uh, the matrix based approach will wrongly identify it as an unbalanced one. Let S1 and S2 be permutations, then <coughs> the sum of this formula over, uh, over this set is zero. For the proof, we divide the sum into two parts. In the first part, we take the sum of x then for y. In the second part, we take the sum in the reverse order. Since S1 and S2 are permutations, the two inner sums are of zeros. <clears throat> By the previous theorem, uh, we can get a 10 round integral distinguisher for skinny. <clears throat> Now we move to zero sum distinguishing. Assume that the expression of one word of round R is of the form, uh, it is the XOR of F1 and F2, where F1 is independent of PI and F2 is independent of PJ. Then the cipher has an R round zero sum skinny. For instance, for skinny, after five encryption round, P14 doesn't occur in X57 and P13 doesn't occur in this formula. Furthermore, we have <coughs> this formula. So the sum of these words over the four plain texts formed as P13 and P14 take A, B, A, C, D, B, D, C, and the other words fixed the sum is zero. We can also use the occurrences of the linear combinations of the output words. <clears throat> By this formula, we can see that <clears throat> the XOR sum of the two words only depend on the 12th words of X5. And this word is independent of P, 
15. So this is a strong quantity differential requiring a single plain text self text pair for distinguishing skinny from the other blocks. I can also extend the distinguisher one more round by by uh, by letting the, this word active and the other word fixed, and we have to add two constraints on uh, uh, on these formulas. Uh, sorry, Wen Ying, uh, time is almost over. Over, please uh, try okay, to conclude okay, as soon okay, as possible. Okay. okay. This is the theorem, I'll skip it. And we also give the uh, practical attack on 11 round skinny. That's all, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, the next time the talk is uh, new related to key uh, boomerang and rectangle attacks on Deoxys BC, including BDT effect by uh, Bob Zin Zhao. Uh, Xia Yang uh, Dung and uh, Keting Jia. Uh, and uh, Bosnian will uh, present the paper. And I hope that I could uh, pronounce the names correctly. Can you see my screen? Yes, please go. Ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhao Boxing, and the talk uh, title of my talk is New Related Twin Key Boomerang and Rectangle Attacks on Deoxys BC, including BDT Effect. And my, uh, my talk consists of four parts. The first is overview of Deoxys. Uh, it's uh, designed by, by Jamie Jean and others, and there are two A80 mode, and the, the two versions uh, are all adapt uh, the Deoxys BC as their internal primitive. And for the version 256, there are 14 rounds, and for the version 384, there are 16 rounds. And the Deoxys BC adapts uh, AES run function. They are add run twin key, sub bytes, shape rows, and mixed columns. And the uh, sub twin key is updated by the uh, liner permutation function H and two liner feedback shift re registers. And he here is a, a framework uh, that uh, Deoxys BC 384. And the, the, the uh, second part is a new related twin key boomerang distinguisher. And F at FSE to 2017, Seed uh, proposed an efficient MLP mode to search related twin key boomerang distinguisher, but they, uh, they didn't take the diffusion of the end of the distinguishers into consideration. So we make two improvements. We generate one or two more rounds of the constraint, and then at the end, we limit the number of S active S box at the end extra rounds. And for the first round, we add, uh, add constraints for the other round twin key and the mixed columns. And for the second uh, X round, we only add, a string, uh, as, uh, add a constraints for the other round twin key. And at the end, we limit the active S box. We can test it from uh, zero to 50. And uh, the boomerang uh, difference table uh, uh, is pro was proposed by Wang. Uh, we can think it a little boomerang, and the, the BDT frame, uh, we can think it the uh, opposite uh, direction of BDT. And here is an example of two round boomerang switch. And, and uh, besides, there is there another advantage of the new distinguisher uh, for the version uh, 256, uh, we extend, uh, extend the one round for the uh, my round distinguisher. Uh, after the sub byte, there are uh, nine active bytes. And but uh, if we extend one round for in CHP seventeen, there will be a uh, ten active bytes. And for the uh, version three eight four, if we attend two round for the eleven round distinguisher, after the sub bytes uh, function, there will be uh, twelve active bytes. But uh, at the CHP seventeen. All the bytes will be will be active, 
And the third is a general strategy of care recovery attack. Uh, here is a framework. And uh, the e, uh, e, E0 and E1 is the distinguisher, and EB is a prefix round uh, before, the, before the distinguisher, and EF is a uh, round uh, extend from the end of the distinguisher. And we can construct a uh, cortex by construct S1 and S2 uh, first. And S1, S2 ex uh, include the uh, plain test, plain test uh, pairs that uh, can, inc uh, can encrypt to the start difference alpha. And uh, then uh, obtain the, the quartet and we can uh, count, the, count the key. And the complexity is here, the su successful probability as follows. And the, the boomerang attack is similar uh, uh, similar to the rectangle attack. We can construct two sides uh, first and then obtain the uh, cortex and then count for the keys. And the complexity and the success probability are as follows. Mm, uh, the, the last part is the applications. Uh, but since I, I, I think uh, you have uh, still a lot of slides uh, and uh, they left, but uh, the time is almost over. So please try to conclude. Okay. Uh, here is uh, here the 14 round, uh, 14 round attack, and the time complexity is uh, 2286.2. And here is the 10 round, uh, the verse to the version 256. And this here is a summary. For the uh, for the two five two five six, we improve the ten around ten round attack and give the eleven round attack for the first time. And for the version three eighty four, we improve the twelve and thirteen round attack and give the uh, fourteen round attack for the first time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the last talk is uh, on the Faisal counterpart of the boomerang connectivity connectivity table, introduction and analysis of the F FBCT by Hamid Bukerl, uh, Paul Hein, uh, Wajin Lalemand, uh, Bimel uh, Mantel, and uh, Marine uh, Minel. And uh, Paul will present the paper. Um, yes, thank you for the introduction. Can you all see my slide and hear me? Yes, please. All right. All right, perfect. Um, so another talk on boomerang attacks, but this one is going to focus more on the theoretical aspects um, and more specifically the FISO case. Oh, sorry. All right, so in a boomerang distinguisher, what you're looking at is um, the difference between forms. Yeah, uh, I think somebody, a uh, boxing. Yeah, everybody's on mute now, please go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, you have a first message that's picked at random and you're going to ask for its ciphertext C0. Then you can do the same thing for M1, which is M0 XOR with an input difference alpha and get C1. And then you're going to compute two more ciphertexts by adding a difference delta to C0 and C1 and the corresponding plain text M2 and M3 are retrieved. And so what you want here is for M2 and M3 to differ by the initial value alpha. So that's the basic uh, distinguisher, right? Um, and as we've seen with uh, Boshin's talk, one way to do that is to split the cipher into three parts. So this was described by uh, Dunkelman, Keller, and Shamir in the sandwich attack framework. So you have an upper layer, E0, and of course you want a good differential of say probability P or this part, and same thing for the lower layer E1, so a good differential of probability Q. And in between you have EM, which is, well, which was initially made of one round called the boomerang switch, which is going to cover the dependencies between E0 and E1. And so if EM satisfied the differential propagation we need with probability R, then the distinguisher has a probability P squared Q squared R. So the question that remains is how do you compute R? Well, for SPNs uh, in the one round case, the analysis has been made really easy thanks to this table right here on the left. And that's the boomerang connectivity table, BCT for short, introduced by Sid, Huang, Perrin, Sezaki, and Sa. And so the idea is as follows. So starting from the condition that needs to be satisfied for EM, 
So that's the equation appearing on the screen right now. Um, since the nonlinear layer of an SPN is made of S boxes applied in parallel, it's easy to derive a set of independent conditions on those. And so you end up with equations of the following form. And that's how you build your BCT. The BCT is going to tell you exactly how many, how many inputs are going to satisfy the required boomerang transition at the S-box level. So this reduces the problem of computing the probability over one round to the one of computing it over each S-box. And then the, your entire probability is going to be the product of all of them. So that's what the BCT does. Um, it also quickly detects the special cases, like the ones where the boomerang doesn't come back at all. So these are the zeros in your table. It also detects um, the cases when it always comes back, like um, what's called the ladder switch. Um, all right, so we have this great tool, but it only applies to SPNs. Um, so in our paper, we introduce this new table here on the right, which we call the FBCT, so the FISO counterpart of the BCT. And the formula is given right here in the orange box. So the way we obtain it is described in the paper. Um, but what we can notice is, is that it's basically the number of times the second order derivative of S cancels out. So now, now that we have uh, our definition, we of course uh, studied some of its properties. So here are some very simple ones that we can derive from the definition. But what's perhaps more interesting would be the behavior of the boomerang uniformity. So for SPNs, um, this has already been studied um, by Bourra and Canto and presented uh, here at FEC two years ago. Um, and so when we compare them for several classes of equivalents, that's what we get. We get this table right here. Um, and so the key point here is that a good as box for an SPN is going to be a good as box for a still regarding many different uh, criteria like um, differential or linear properties, algebraic degree, you name it. But the behavior can be different regarding the boomerang switches, um, depending on the type of construction it's used in. Um, so as a recap, so here I have presented a tool, the FBCT, inspired by the BCT, which allows you to compute a one round switch for the FISO case. Um, so that's the formula, and the probability is given uh, in the orange uh, equation. So T here is the number of S boxes in the nonlinear layer. But we didn't stop there. So we also describe a simple expression of uh, for a two round switch. And to do so, we need to add um, another condition to the FPCT. So that's the output difference between S boxes. So this was, this has already been done for SPN um, in two other papers presented last year here at FAC. Uh, so that was the BDT that Boshin talked about in the previous print presentation. Um, so that's the BDT right here. And um, the idea is to use these on the first round and the second round of your switch um, to compute the probability. And you can do the same thing for three rounds and more. Um, and to do so, you need to add an extra parameter to your table. So we called it the FASTO boomerang extended table. Um, and it's given below. So basically, you're just fixing all the differences. Um, and here's a, an example for three rounds. Uh, so all of this is in our paper. Um, thank you for your attention. OK, thank you. Uh, for, thanks to all the speakers. I guess it's now uh, time to ask questions. Um, we actually got a couple of questions in the chat, and I will uh, start with a question from Gaëtan. Um, so this question is for Ike. Um, is there hope to extend your six-round distinguisher to a seven-round attack? Yeah, should I just read what I answered to Gaëtan? <laughs> I don't know. Um, thank you for the question. Um, very interesting. Um, with the team from Christian Reschberger and Sontra Ronium, we already had a quick look at it um, because Sontra Ronium had a generalization actually on ePrint. And we tried to find seven round distinguishers, but could not find anything that had a low enough data complexity in that. So 
for the moment at least there's nothing trivial pity in it but maybe there is some more advanced thing of a combined distinguisher or so but we did not find these things yet anyways um f a seven round distinguisher would be extremely relevant this okay. would be the strongest distinguisher on the AS, and we would want to know if this thing really works and what the influence of the S box and positions also are. And therefore, it may be that it's not even any more feasible to um, implement it with a small version, and therefore, we would have to understand the S box influence better. Okay. Um, I, I will ask uh, one question further in this direction because I'm kind of interested in it. Um, so in your key recovery attack, uh, you um, pre-bended the, the key recovery to your distinguisher. Exactly. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, what what is actually the, the biggest hurdle in uh, appending a key recovery phase to the distinguisher? Is it just the, the pure uh, data complexity or the complexity in uh, the key guessing phase? If you see... Uh good way of what to guess, then, then this may work. So I don't see a direct hurdle. I just don't know exactly what is the best way of guessing. What is the lowest complexity? So this is an interesting question. Okay. Maybe it's beyond exhaustive search. OK, OK. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I had another question for Eck. Uh, that I also wrote in the uh, chat and I already answered, but maybe you can answer here again. So there, you, you always showed these uh, experiments on small AS and they were always better than what you expected. And the question is if you can explain why. I would love to. I cannot really explain why. And actually we found afterwards that the distinguishers are very index dependent and depending on the properties of the S-box. Sorry for taking too much time already, so I did not show this good enough uh, in the talk. And actually, we found that really mapping the first cell to the first output cell did not yield a distinguisher at all afterwards. And it was great to have then an approach that we could that we found we could write this as an equation system and really could show also in theory that there are these index dependent um, deviations and that we could also do this for the real AS in, with this equation systems. And it seems really that the deviations are much smaller and they all yield in theory a distinguisher for the real AS that the small size of only having four rounds and only this four bit S box, um, we think much of this is the reason for this large deviations. We used also many other S boxes and so larger deviations. In general, the worse or the larger the variance of the S-box, the larger the deviations in both directions. There were also many S-boxes that yielded many less collisions that anticipated. So it's still open to hopefully answer your question. OK, yeah, it thank you very much. <laughs> question to uh, maybe we go to, to Andre's talk on quantum IES. Um, so yeah. there were, I think, two questions so far and maybe related. And the question is, uh, what about the text in the Q2 model that either you just assume you have access to uh, a quantum computer uh, implementing the secret key or then uh, <coughs> Stefan was asking, maybe you guess part of the secret key and implement it, implement your own Q2 oracle for this. And the question is, is this of help? Yeah, um, so about the Q2 model actually, uh, it happened that all the attacks we had in the paper in the end worked uh, fine with the standard queries. Uh, but it was more like uh, um, there is no metaphysical reason for this. It's just that uh, we we designed attacks uh, that were uh, not query intensive. So they, they, they could uh, make uh, some classical queries and, and then reuse them during the uh, process. But Q2 queries could have helped. Like, uh, for example, the Demiosis Setsuk attack, if you write it uh, at first, it seems to require Q2 queries, but then you can remove them and so on. So uh, I guess there are cases where you can have a, a score root speedup, which is going to use uh, Q2 attacks, even if we didn't do that. And then uh, to know whether there are much better attacks than the classical using Q2 queries, but I don't know. Um, 
usually we think, uh, so if, if it happens, of course, it would be a very interesting result. But usually what happens is that uh, AS is very, uh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't exhibit the uh, kind of uh, strong algebraic structure that we need uh, or that we use in the Q2 attacks. Uh, and what Stefan was proposing uh, actually might work if such a property exists. Like you can, you can, if you can indeed guess part of the key and then say, if this part of the key is guessed, uh, the, what, what remains is something very structured and I can break it in Q2. This would perfectly work. If, if you can have such a property, it would be really interesting. But so far we, we, we simply don't know, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. And then I will continue asking questions uh, that have been asked in the chat. So, uh, Ragvendra has a question to Hossein. Do you have any insights on whether the repeated pattern of odd and or even round rays may help in a boomerang distinguisher of a craft? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the last check I, I represented uh, reminds the idea of boomerang attack where we divide the cipher into three parts and try to find the best differential threads for the first and last part. However, handling the dependency in the middle, in the middle part of boomerang distinguishers of craft is not that easy. You know, uh, uh, in other words, uh, I should say that uh, we can use these repeat repeatable distinguishers for boomerang to find better boomerang distinguishers. However, handling the middle part uh, is not that easy. I, I'm not sure whether I could answer well or not. Okay, thanks for the answer. Um, there's also a, a second question to uh, Hussein, so we uh, continue with that. Um, did you, so the question is from Sharam, uh, did you try to use the distinguisher in a key recovery attack? Uh, if so, can you tell up to which number of rounds uh, you are able to attack? Yeah, uh, no, we, we have not provided key recovery attacks for our distinguisher. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. We only um, we only propose some distinguishers. We improved the previous distinguishers. Okay. Uh, Thank thanks for the answer. Um, yes. Uh, then I have uh, another question for Andre. Um, you have looked at, at several attacks uh, and on AS, and lately we we have seen attacks or uh, distinguishers on AS, which cover five rounds or so, um, where it's quite hard to, to use them, uh, or it seems at least to quite hard to use them in a key recovery attack. Uh, have you had a look at such distinguishers or such properties like a multiple of eight or something like that? Um, so uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, uh, I don't remember if we how much of a look we had, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, as of today, I, I don't really know if it, if it is going to be uh, uh, really helpful. Problem is, in general, uh, without without superposition queries. So if we mm -hmm. like suppose that we remain the standard model, um, the attacks, the speed ups that we're going to obtain on attacks are going to be uh, quadratic at best. Uh, in this setting. So uh, if, if you're unable to make a classical attack that uses these new distinguishers, um, then a quantum attack using them is maybe not going to, to, to work uh, also. Okay. Uh, because usually, uh, if, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, usually the, the, the new distinguishers, uh, it, it, it gets a bit more difficult to, uh, to like happen more rounds to make a key recovery, right? Sometimes. Uh, yeah, yes. So basically, the, the complexity in the key guessing part is then too high. Can, yeah, it can, can get higher. Yeah. So, it, so it may also get higher in our case, and then. Uh, okay. Be, so, be so basically, you just, uh, yeah, it's, it's very hard yeah. to get uh, yeah. more than the right. basic speed. Up. Yeah, that's, okay. that's always kind of the problem. But maybe, I don't know, maybe in superposition setting, uh, there is something uh, somewhere that is going to be really helpful. Uh, I can't, I can't predict that. Okay, I see that uh, Gregor has another question. Maybe he wants to ask then. 
can it ask i can ask it directly a uh, question to paul um so you showed that uh, if i understood this table correctly you showed that uh, with respect to this um Feistel boomerang connectivity table the inverse s box potentially behaves differently than the s box itself right um, so they would yeah. cross out yeah and then you could imagine that attacks on the encryption might behave differently than for the decryption um so if you're using it in an in an SPM, you mean? No, no, for a Faisal, yeah. If you want to attack a Faisal, it might make a difference. It, I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's not clear to me why this should make a difference, but... Uh... Um, because what we've seen so far is that basically the, the inverse of the S-Box doesn't really come at play um, in the uh, in the FBCT. Very stupid question. Uh, yes. Thank you, Ramos. Or no, no. Is that... no, I think it's very stupid. Yes. Oh. No, 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 it's good. It's, I think it's. Uh, I understand because in the inverse of the Faisal, it's, you don't use the inverse S box, right? Yeah. So, like, you could think of a case where you would be like using an S box that's currently used in an F, in a Faisal, um, but use it in an SPN. Um, I don't know, like Clefia, and in that case, yeah, that that would be different. Um, the values are I mean, different. Is there a way to re remove questions from the chat? <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the clarification. Um, okay. Is there more questions? I don't think there are more questions on the chat. And I'm not going to ask any more. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I have a question for uh, Wen Ying. So in your presentation, you focused, or in the attack, you focused on uh, skinny 128, 128. Uh, do you think if you uh, uh, look at the larger versions with larger twe uh, tweak, that might be also be uh, used by an attacker, could you attack more rounds? Um. Thank you for the question. Um, to be honest, uh, we we haven't uh, taken into account the take taking. So, we, we, do, do you plan to do it as future work or? Do you mean the future work? Yes. Do you plan to to do it uh, in the future to analyze oh. also this no, or? No. No, no, we, we haven't uh, we haven't done uh, workers uh, on TIC, but we have done something on the festival uh, structure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the answer. Thank you. <laughs> so, if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, thank all the speakers of the session, uh, and uh, thank you very much and uh, have a break, I guess. <laughs>